I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Berkovich. He is the scientific and medical chair of PXC International. Um, he is the founding medical director of PXC International, and he is uniquely qualified as an advocate, clinician, and researcher for PXC. He became intensely involved in PXC following his diagnosis of Elizabeth and Ian Terry with PXC in 1994. And over the last 12 years, he's authored many papers on PXC, examined hundreds of people affected by PXC, and has given much of his spare time to research on the condition. He does comprehensive clinical evaluations of PXCers. He's actively involved in many clinical research projects, and he's a clinical resource for healthcare professionals and lay people alike. Dr. Berkovich is also a clinical professor of dermatology at Brown Medical School in Providence, Rhode Island where he is a full-time pediatric dermatologist at Hasbro Children's Hospital and Rhode Island Hospital. He's also a dermatologist at Brown University Health Service, director of the Brown Contact Dermatitis and Occupational Dermatology Unit, and he's a faculty leader of an innovative seminar course in biomedical ethics in the Department of Dermatology. Dr. Berkovich is a graduate of the University of Manitoba Medical School in Canada, and he's board certified in the U.S. in dermatology, pediatric dermatology, and internal medicine. And he's also a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons of Canada in ophthalmology. And Dr. Berkovich, thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, we're ready to start. Okay. Um, just before I, I – is the, uh, the screen um, control panel showing on your screen? Because I, I can remove it from mine. I just uh... – Yes, it's showing. And you can remove it. You probably okay. don't need it. Mm -hmm. Uh, no, I don't want to leave the webinar. So wait a minute. I don't want to. That's not. No, just, how to how to how to how to minimize it? Um, there's a little um, stippled mark on that bar, and you can press that stippling. Ah, nope. It moved to the other side. That didn't. We didn't want to do that. We don't see yours, so you can start. Oh no! You know, I mean, what I'm saying, you're not seeing mine. Is what I'm saying. Correct. We don't. Okay, see Okay, fine. Yours. I just want to obscure the slides. That's all. Okay. Oh, yep. All right. Well, uh, some of you may have, uh, who have attended some of the PXC meetings and the uh, biannual meetings may have heard some of this material. I, I, I actually updated it uh, right up to the today's New York Times, so we have we have all the hottest information. Um, and let me just so we're going to talk about several different aspects of uh, gender and PXC. Um, one of them is is just the whole issue of of does PXC differentially affect one gender more than another. Uh, oral contraceptives and PXC, and we're going to, as we, as you'll, you'll notice a pattern as we go along. We're going to be dealing with issues that involve women in in, in older age groups, and then we'll sort of tie it all together at the end uh, with some issues regarding mammography and and then uh, and some dietary advice and so forth. Uh, we're going to talk about pregnancy and PXC, um, hormone replacement therapy and PXC, or PXC in the menopause. Um, then we're going to talk about calcium and PXC, and then and what, are, what the current state of thinking is, uh, mammography and PXE. So we're going to talk first about gender and PXE. Most published studies have shown the preponderance of females, usually in a ratio of 2 to 1. And, um, and that's been pretty well all studies which have had multiple PXE patients. And our registry is approximately 65 to 70 percent females, so that seems to bear it out as well. And we're not really sure why. Um, this is, you can see, this is, this is the gender response to our questionnaires. And we figured, well, you know, maybe it's just when men don't tend to answer these things, or they're not, not as forthcoming with information. So we asked people who had PXE what the, uh, what the gender of their affected siblings was. And then we sort of did a cross, uh, removed the ones who got mentioned twice, because if a man mentioned a sister and a sister mentioned her brother, uh, then not that wouldn't then we have to cancel that out. We, we have both of them in the registry already. And we found that of the siblings, 72% were female and 28% were male. So this it's clearly not just selection of who enters the survey. And we're still not sure why that is, but this seems to be a constant thing in all of the surveys as well. And we're not sure why, as I said, the PXC gene is not on a sex chromosome. And as far as we know, it's the carrier frequency is the same in males and females. And there's no reason why it shouldn't be. Um, there's a thing in in epidemiology and public health and biostatistics called reporting bias, where uh, a group you might be studying may be more likely to report itself. So females tend to self-report more frequently. We know that's true. And then there's a stoic male phenomenon, where males are less likely to join support groups. Uh, they just suffer in silence. Uh, but that's not enough to explain it either. Uh, it's possible that some males may have a subclinical phenotype. Um, 
the PX, in other words, they, they, they may have PXE, but it's just not readily apparent to, to somebody observing it from, from, from the outside. PXE gene expression may be regulated by hormones so that women may express it earlier or differently. And the PXE phenotype itself may be um, affected by hormones. So uh, how, it, how you look, for example, how much skin involvement or how much eye involvement may be partly related to uh, the hormonal environment. Um, or some other so-called epigenetic or non-gene non related uh, factor, um, or the actual degree to which the gene is expressed overall may, may be somehow affected by hormones. It's also possible, as you will see later on, that the, the phenotype may differ between males and females, leading to delay in diagnosis or underdiagnosis in males. For example, if it's more obvious on the skin in females than in males, you're more likely to diagnose females sooner. It's also possible females and males may differ in other factors which might affect the phenotype. The phenotype is how the gene looks, how, how, how the uh, gene expresses itself, for example, how you look or what's or measuring some factor in the blood, for example. So pregnancy, smoking, sun exposure, hypertension, calcium intake, and metabolism may also um, be different in females than in males. It may be that that may be part of the reason why uh, the, the gene is expressed differently in both genders. It's possible, although unlikely, that PXC can be lethal to some male fetuses so that fewer males with PXC are born. Um, there's really no way to tell that um, because it, it, if it's lethal to the male fetus and it's not obvious, nobody's likely to be looking for PXC in the male fetus. But it, it seems that's, that's probably not the reason in this case for the differential. So as I mentioned, even when siblings of affected individuals are studied, it still appears to be more frequent than females. And it's not account for by, strictly by inheritance of the mutations, which should not be affected by gender at all. These are, it's not associated with a sex chromosome. So in males, if you look at the, um, the, the group here between 5 and 7 o'clock, the 19% group, and the 10% in, in like, like turquoise, um, those are pa patients who present with, um, so I'm sorry, the light yellow, sure, the 18%. 37% uh, in males had presented with, uh, um, I'm sorry, yeah, the, I'm sorry, the three groups, the light, turquoise, the yellow, and the maroon, account for 47% of the patients. And these are the ones presenting with eye alone or neck plus eyes uh, or um, um, combination of, um, or just angioid streaks. So, uh, the patients with who the 19 percent group actually presented with a drop in visual acuity and some visual change, whereas the 10 percent just had an abnormal eye exam. So 40 percent presented with neck findings, 47 percent presented with either eye findings plus neck or just eye findings. In females, 60 percent presented with just skin findings, and 12 percent presented with decreased vision, and another uh, 19 percent presented with or sorry another 9 percent presented with. Uh, uh, neck plus eyes, which meant that's 81%, sorry, 71%, 81% right there, and then a smaller number presented with just uh, ang angioid streaks. So the great preponderance of females, when they present, present with because of findings on their skin, whereas with males, it's often picked up by an eye doctor, and the skin findings are just sort of noticed at the same time. So that's a mystery. We don't know what the what the reason is, and it may be partly that women present differently, so it's diagnosed earlier. But sooner or later, the number of people, the number of males and females, ought to even out because eventually it, it, it's going to be manifest in, in both genders if, if it's there. We're going to talk next about birth control pills or hormonal contraceptives. Um, <clears throat> some of the data we have on this came from our epidemiologic study. Uh, and some is just a general, a general understanding of what birth control pills are and why they might or might not have an effect in PXE. For the most part, birth control pills are a combination of a synthetic estrogen um, and a synthetic progestin. Progestins are progesterone-like hormones that are involved in, in uh, building up and um, maintaining the uterine lining. And the newer oral contraceptives use very low doses of estrogen without compromising contraceptive efficacy, so it cuts down the number of, of side effects. And for those who can't tolerate um, the oral contraceptive pills, the uh, estrogen can be uh, the uh, estrogen and progestin can be given by by a patch, uh, by what's called the Nuva ring. It's a vaginal ring. Uh, you can give Depo-Provera, which is a shot of uh, progesterone only. They can use Norplant, which is an implanted estrogen, uh, sort of progesterone source that lasts about three years. 
or do you take a progesterone-only birth control pill? Women who can't take estrogen, um, as I said, can use the shots or use uh, or use a barrier method or other or the progesterone uh, uh, contraceptives. And the choice of hormonal contraceptive can be tailored to the risk of clotting, lipid profile, acne, estrogen-related side effects, and breakthrough bleeding. And we'll talk about that in a moment to explain what the uh, uh, what the reason uh, or why why that is. So hormonal contraceptives have certain benefits. They're safe, um, convenient. They're reliable if you take them every day and don't miss doses. And it's reversible. You stop taking it, uh, theoretically, things should go back to normal, although sometimes there's a period of amenorrhea and, uh, or loss of not having periods for several months. They probably reduce the risk of ovarian endometrial cancer while they're being taken. They reduce the, they can, they can improve uh, acne and, and herstism or excess hair growth, although some form, some of the older birth control pills can make acne worse. They can reduce the risk of osteoporosis, endometriosis, fibroids, and because they prevent pregnancy, they reduce the risk of ectopic pregnancies, which are tubal pregnancies. But they have potential side effects. The most serious one is the risk of blood clotting. In patients who smoke, the risk of stroke is seven times that of patients who don't stroke, or actually who don't smoke, I should say. The most serious side effect is the risk of uh, myocardial infarction or deep vein thrombosis, myocardial infarction being a heart attack, or stroke. Even with the patch, there's twice as much risk as with uh, taking the oral contraceptive because it bypasses the liver for metabolism uh, in the first pass. And it can cause nausea, breast enlargement, breast tenderness, fluid retention, acne, uh, mood change, depression, fatigue, and weight gain. But these are not common side effects, but these are the ones that are most commonly reported. So they're not without, they're not, they're not, a, they're not well tolerated by everybody who takes them, and some women can't tolerate certain birth control pills. Now, contraindications means um, the reasons why you might, you would not be allowed to or should not take something. And there are contra and certain contraindications exist for birth control pills. And these include a history of blood clots. There's a history of a stroke or heart attack or deep vein thrombosis or patients who have diabetic cardiovascular disease, uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure, active liver disease or history of jaundice from oral contraceptives, uh, those who, uh, who are smokers who are older than 35 years, uh, patients who have migraine with focal neurologic signs, it's thought that these patients may be at increased risk for a stroke uh, with birth control pills. So these might be people who have a hemiplegic migraine where they, they, they get weakness uh, in an extremity or they have sensory loss in an extremity or they might have uh, loss of a visual field, things of that nature. Those who have had breast cancer in the last five years, uh, women who are currently breastfeeding. Now what about birth control pills and PXE? There's no published data on oral contraceptives and PXE, but there's no evidence to date from our studies of adverse effects of birth control pill on PXE, but the numbers are very small. We just have uh, probably two or 300 women in the survey who took birth control pills. Nobody reported any uh, adverse cardiovascular side effects, at least while they were on the pill. Um, it's recommended that oral contraceptives should be avoided in those who have established cardiovascular disease or history of hypertension or smoking above the age of 35 or deep vein thrombosis, as we just went over. Uh, and if, if possible, low estrogen birth control pills are preferred because these have a lower risk of inducing clotting than the higher estrogen ones. And if, if, estrogen, if contraception is desired or hormonal contraception is desired and, um, the, um, uh, and, progest and, and, and um, estrogen is contraindicated, um, then um, barrier, con sorry, barrier contraception or progesterone can be used. So pregnancy, that's the next, the next logical step in life after the birth control pill. And we did a study um, about seven years ago, uh, which was published in the British Journal of Dermatology, which is the largest single study to date um, involving uh, women who, who, who've been pregnant and have PXE. And, um, we had 795 pregnancies and 306 women with PXE, and that's a lot. And the previous largest study, I think, was something like 50 pregnancies. And um, we found that the mean birth weight, the incidence of low birth weight, and prematurity were all within the normal range, all within the expected range, no different than, than, than the non-PXE population. 
83% of the pregnancies ended in live births and 1% ended the still ended the stillbirth. So that's about what you'd expect in, in, a, in a normal population. Twelve percent of the women reported worsening of skin manifestations during pregnancy. Um, whether this was due to the pregnancy or not, you, it's impossible to tell. Uh, uh, and some of these the changes got better afterwards, and some they didn't. In some cases, it might have been partly age-related. It's hard to know because it's not a, it's not a common uh, occurrence. But uh, we know about the women who've reported that. Ten percent developed gestational hypertension or pregnancy-related hypertension, uh, which is not, uh, which is about normal. The incidence of normal pregnancies is about 10 to 12 percent. In the books um, and in previous uh, journal articles, the, the most feared complication in pregnancy was gastric bleeding, and, and many women were advised not to become pregnant because of the, the risk of gastric bleeding, and uh, uh, it turned out this was only found in less than 1 percent of all the pregnancies that we had studied, and only one, less than 1 percent had any retinal complications during pregnancy, so it appeared that in these cases, the, the pregnancy might have been coincidental. Seventy-six percent of pregnancies were completely uncomplicated, which I think is really an a very important statistic. Um, we found no correlation between either how many times a woman had been pregnant or whether or not she'd ever been pregnant with the clinical severity of the skin, eye, and cardiovascular manifestations in women over 40. We had to choose women over 40 because we have to have women who are old enough to have these side effects. It was no, wouldn't be any point in studying it in women who were in their 30s because most of those wouldn't have had those side effects anyway. And when we took the older group, age group, we found that uh, pregnancy had no effect on the future course of PXE. So that was a very heartening finding as well. But the, the sobering uh, uh, piece of evidence we found is that of the 101 women who had never been pregnant uh, who were in the study, 17% were advised against becoming pregnant by a healthcare professional. Uh, and 11% feared an adverse outcome either in their pregnancy or disease. So I think that that's, that's a very, um, um, I mean, I think this kind of study is very helpful. Like we're getting a lot of uh, calls and emails in, in, over the last few years from uh, obstetricians, midwives, genetic counselors, and even patients. And having this kind of information has made it much, uh, much uh, uh, less scary for women who are going through this because uh, the data is, is, has been so reassuring. So to the best of our knowledge, PXD is not associated with markedly increased incidence of fetal loss, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and that the incidence of gastric bleeding, although higher than the general population, is much lower than previously reported and may not be that much any higher than people who, do, who are, have PXD but are not pregnant. And retinal complications, although occurring in PXD, tend to be uncommon. And to summarize again, the vast majority of PXC pregnancies are uncomplicated. There is no basis for advising women with PXC to avoid becoming pregnant. And there's no correlation between the number of pregnancies and the ultimate severity of PXC. So we'll skip over, uh, fast forward about 20 years to uh, uh, when you have to start worrying about hormone replacement uh, therapy, and that's the menopause. And I'm sure many of you are aware there's been a, a real uh, see change in thought about hormone replacement therapy in the last um, seven years. Uh, you probably remember that there was a large women, uh, women's health initiative study going on, to, uh, which was sponsored by the NIH and with the cooperation of Wyeth, who manufactured Premarin, which is the um, and um, uh, which is a common estrogen replacement uh, product, and uh, also the the manufacturer of the common estrogen progesterone replacement product. And um, so the menopause um, is defined as the end of a woman's re reproductive life. Most of you probably define it as hot flashes and, and uh, you know, the, 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 the end of the good times. But uh, the, it technically, it's the end of a woman's re reproductive life because the ovaries stop ovulating. Then they cease producing estrogen, and what happens there, therefore, is that the endometrium ceases to, that's the lining of the uterus, ceases to, to uh, uh, develop in the shed, and then the menses stop, so periods stop completely. And for most women, this occurs sometime between the age of uh, 48 and 52, but it can occur as early as the uh, uh, late 30s or early 40s, and as late as 53 or 54, but, the, but most occur between 48 and 52. Um, once after a year of amenorrhea, or not feeling to have periods, a woman is considered to be postmenopausal. 
And what happens, as you can see in these pictures, is the lower one being the uh, postmenopausal reproductive system, the uterus, uterine thick wall becomes less thick, the ovaries become much smaller, and they're no longer, or no longer producing eggs, the vagina, vaginal mucosa starts to atrophy, and the cervix becomes uh, atrophic as well. And symptoms occur. And you can see from this table that hot flashes or flushing, night sweats, sleep disturbance, um, anxiety, depression, irritability, um, diminished concentration in memory, and uh, vaginal dryness and soreness are very common uh, side effects being reported in, in over half of women. Um, and in about half of the patients who report these side effects, they're, they're, they're quite problematic and, and may require treatment. Other symptoms of menopause, and besides the ones that were mentioned in the previous slide, which include uh, the, ones I, uh, the ones I read to you, um, include a decrease in sexual interest and function, which can be multifactorial. It may be due to mood change. It may be due to uh, um, sleep disturbance. It may be due to fatigue. It may be due to uh, uh, some of the physiologic changes. Uh, can be due, they can present with aching joints, headache, nocturia, or getting up at night to urinate, feeling unable to cope. And these statistics here are the, the, the first statistics, the number of women reporting them. This, this finding and the one following that is the number for, for whom it was truly a, a problem uh, needing treatment. And there are conditions related to the menopause. Uh, osteoporosis, uh, which we'll talk about in more, in more detail, cognitive changes, gynecologic problems, and cardiovascular conditions. Now, it was felt for many years that that the logical treatment for the menopause uh, was hormone replacement, that if you, didn't, if you stopped making hormones, then replacing the hormones ought to really uh, reverse some of the changes in the skin, some of the changes in, in uh, the bones, the changes in cognition, um, um, some of the changes in, in, uh, uh, in, in sexual function, um, mood changes, and so forth. And for women who had their uterus, uh, the hormone replacement consists of a combination of estrogens and progestin. Uh, estrogens um, um, being given either orally or in a patch, and uh, progestin. Uh, and, and most and most of these are uh, most of the ones given orally are natural. They're made from pregnant mare's urine. That's why it's called uh, permanent. But some are also synthetic, like estradiol. Uh, the progestins are can be natural or synthetic, but most were synthetic progestins. And the reason for adding progestin is because if you didn't have uh, cycling of the lining of the uterus where it was periodically being shed, um, there was an increased risk of endometrial or uterine cancer. And, um, and once the hysterectomy would be, were, was performed or if, there, or, or if the women didn't have a uterus, there would be no need for progestin and then the replacement would be just estrogen therapy. And there are certain benefits to hormone replacement therapy. Uh, estrogen provides most of the benefits, relief of menopausal symptoms, increase of bone mass, uh, some improvement in lipids, perhaps a decrease in, in, uh, in certain uh, types of fractures. But in randomized studies, the, the, uh, the actual health outcomes have not been proven uh, because a lot of these things, such as improved bone mass and improvement in lipids, uh, are just a proxy. They're just a marker for uh, the real outcome you're looking for, which is um, uh, bones which don't fracture as readily and, and, uh, and decreased heart disease. And uh, progestin, as I said, reduces the risk of endometrial cancer in women who are on hormone replacement, but it's not needed after hysterectomy. It, the Women's Health Initiative study also showed that, in a, uh, that there was a decrease in the number of hip fractures in women who had been on hormone replacement therapy. One thing that hormone replacement does do, it alleviates flushing and menopausal symptoms while women are on the therapy. But any, there's been no evidence um, that hormone replacement therapy reduces colon cancer, contrary to what would have been reported previously in some of the observational studies, like the large nurses' study. No evidence that it reduced the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, uh, coronary risk. It had no effect on established dementia, depression, urinary incontinence, and no value in, in the secondary prevention, prevention of uh, coronary, heart, coronary heart disease, uh, myocardial infarction, which is heart attacks or stroke. And hormone therapy does have certain risks, an increased risk of uh, heart attack and stroke during the first year of therapy, uh, an increase in breast cancer, 
uh, if it's taken over five years, particularly for a hormone replacement therapy, not, not so for estrogen replacement therapy, and improve survival of those who've had um, HRT and breast cancer. Increased risk of, of blood clots, venous thromboembolism or, or, or clots in the legs, um, increased by three times. Still not very common, three in 10,000 per year, but still a triple of the risk. And a 40% risk of gallstones, increased risk of gallstones. 25% of women who take hormone replacement therapy will actually discontinue these um, within two years. In, now it's because most physicians will tell women they can only take them for up to two years, but uh, in many cases it's because of breast tenderness, uh, bloating, irritability, headaches, uh, abnormal um, or so-called breakthrough bleeding um, between periods or prolonged heavy uterine bleeding. Um, and so what, what, what happens is that in order to decide whether um, or not to take hormone replacement therapy, you have to really weigh the, the benefits, the, the, if, if the, benefit, the improvement of alleviation of troublesome and disabling menopausal symptoms, which are worse in the first two years after uh, stopping periods, with the increased risk of breast cancer uh, um, after, the first, after taking the hormone replacement every several years, and a possible increase in blood clots and a slight increase in heart attacks in the first year of therapy. Now, much of the controversy about hormone replacement therapy arose because many of the proposed benefits that you've heard about, the protection against heart disease, fractures, Alzheimer's, depression, and incontinence, emerged from the uh, from what are so-called observational studies, which are the, the most famous of one is the longitudinal nurses study that's being run by the Harvard School of Public Health and the Brigham and Women's Hospital. The problem with observational studies as opposed to what we call a randomized control trial where, where um, uh, half the group is a placebo group and half the group is receiving the treatment, uh, as opposed to the observational studies where they're just observing people who've taken the treatment, is that those who use the treatment may differ from those who don't. They may be more health conscious. They may be healthier to begin with. Uh, for example, women who have already have risk factors probably aren't going to be taking uh, hormone replacement therapy. Uh, so there are reasons why these studies are, can lead to totally different conclusions. If, any, if, if, a, if an effect is large, any study will find it, but if the effect is small, a lot of times you need a randomized controlled clinical trial with a lot of people in it to show it. So for this reason, uh, the uh, NIH devised a hormone, hormone replacement therapeutic trial uh, called HRTT of the Women's Health Initiative. And it was started in 1970, 1997, and it was designed to follow 27,000 women between the ages of 50 to 79 for 8 to 12 years. Um, and I'm sorry, I guess it started in 1994 uh, and concluded in 2006. And, and uh, that was the, that's, that's the, that's the well-known study that you, you, were, you were reading about in the newspapers. And what the study found, and this is for the combined estrogen-progestin uh, hormone replacement trial, this is the women receiving both hormones, there was an increased risk of breast cancer, there was an increased risk of stroke, there was an increased risk of coronary disease in year one, there was an increased risk of uh, blood clots. There was a decreased risk of hip fracture and possibly a slight decreased risk of colon cancer. Um, there was no improvement in cognitive function and possibly an increased risk of dementia in this group. And because of the, the findings involving breast cancers, stroke, and heart attacks, the study was discontinued after uh, five, five years, six months in uh, 2002. And, uh, uh, women who were on the study were uh, advised to go off the, uh, the hormone replacement therapy. But what, it was, what, was, what also was found is that the cardiovascular risks are higher the later hormone replacement therapy is started. In women less than the age of 50 that to happen to go on hormone replacement therapy in their, in their 40s or younger, maybe because of, a, uh, because of early menopause, um, the benefits greatly outweigh the risks. Uh, in women over the age of 70, the risks outweigh the benefits, so HRT is contraindicated. Between the ages of 50 and 60, the benefits may outweigh the risks, but hormone therapy should, replacement therapy should be for symptom, menopausal symptoms only. This shouldn't, this shouldn't be done with a, a view to primary prevention of coronary disease because there's no evidence that it's effective as a primary preventive therapy. Now, there was another parallel study which was smaller. 
in which women who had hysterectomies uh, took only estrogen. So this was the estrogen-only study. And when in 2004 the study was discontinued because it was found then that it didn't seem to have any effect on heart disease up or down, but there was an increased risk of stroke, a decreased risk of hip fracture. Uh, there appeared to be no effect on breast cancer risk in the seven years of the study of these women taking only estrogen. Uh, there was an increased risk of dementia and mild cognitive impairment in women who were uh, over the age of 65 taking estrogen alone. And as a result, because of the, um, um, the fact there were no benefits and there was an increased risk of stroke, uh, perhaps an increased risk of dementia, uh, the study was discontinued early as well. Now, those of you who watched the news or maybe read today's New York Times or your local newspaper if it was picked up as a wire service story uh, may have read uh, this story. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is in today's paper. Um, the data in the women who were receiving estrogen only was reanalyzed six years later. I, I, I would think the same thing has been done for the uh, uh, estrogen hormone replacement, estrogen progestin hormone replacement group, but I haven't seen that data. But by 2010, the women in the estrogen only group now had a 23% lower risk of breast cancer than women receiving placebo, both of whom have, were now had been off the treatment for six years. The women who began taking estrogen-only replacement in their 50s had 50% fewer myocardial infarctions and deaths and a significant reduction of clots. So um, it's clear that estrogen-only replacement therapy is different from uh, the combined replacement therapy. You can't do this in women who have their uterus because uh, it would greatly increase the risk of, of um, uterine cancer because of the continuous stimulation of the uterine, uterine lining. But in women who don't have a uterus, you can do this. Um, but they found also the women who were over the age of 70 who had been taking estrogen in the study had a corresponding increase in car car cardiac events and clots. So the women who were older did not benefit, and the women who were younger um, in their 50s did benefit. And the groups, both groups, tend to tend to benefit from a lower risk of breast cancer. And why that is isn't really known. That's something that's going to look, look it's going to require some sort of study because it, it, it's it's a uh, it's one of the few things that's been found to reduce the, the risk of breast cancer. Um, one of the things, one of the one of the issues with the study is that it only involved uh, the drug Premarin, which is the natural hormone. Uh, it isn't known if this also can be generalized to estradiol or some of the synthetic uh, estrogen hormones that are used. So um, that's a lot of stuff to digest. Um, what's the bottom line in PXE? Well, in general. Um, those who have established problems such as reduced bone density, uh, high, high bad cholesterol or low good cholesterol, or high blood pressure or established heart disease should aggressively treat these risk factors. They can take Fosamax or one of the biphosphonate drugs for the osteoporosis. They can make sure they're getting the, the recommended daily allowance of calcium and vitamin D. They can take statins for their hypercholesterolemia, be on appropriate diet therapy, take blood pressure medication, take aspirin uh, if it's not contraindicated in PXE. And, and that's, that's another issue which may, not, may contraindicate aspirin. Uh, exercise, stop smoking, um, lose weight, etc. cetera. Uh, that hormone replacement therapy is not a substitute for any of these things and probably less effective in any of these things. Those who have severe menopausal symptoms who need hormone replacement therapy because of their severity of their symptoms should only take a short term, less than two years, and probably a year or less if possible after medical clearance and then just taper it off. Those with osteoporosis who desire hormone replacement therapy can consider um, what's called a selective uh, estrogen, re uh, estrogen receptor modif uh, modifier, such as raloxifene or Avista, which um, has no effect on menopausal symptoms, uh, but it may reduce cholesterol and improve bone density, and has no effect on breast cancer risk because it doesn't affect the breast cancer, the breast, the breast estrogen receptors. The cardiovascular risks of HRT in women with PXC are unknown. Uh, but I would suggest that PXC should be considered a risk factor because there's a, the 10-year risk of, coronary, of car, cardiovascular disease for peripheral vascular disease, stroke, or heart or coronary disease uh, over a 10-year period in, in the menopausal age group is 20%. And therefore, aggressive management of risk factors by means of other HRT should be undertaken. Uh, women with known cardiovascular disease or increased risk should avoid HRT. So I think that women who uh, have PXE, if at, all, if at all possible, should avoid hormone replacement therapy unless they're really disabled by their symptoms. 
So we're going to move on now to um, calcium and, and diet and, and magnesium, uh, because this is something that comes up all the time and uh, it's something that women are uh, often concerned about. And the main reason for all this concern is, is osteoporosis. And osteoporosis, as some of you are probably aware, is, is a decreased bone mass uh, to the point that there's an increased risk of fracture. You sometimes will hear the term osteopenia. Um, and osteopenia means a reduced bone density, but, uh, but not to the point of an increased risk of fracture. So early bone, bone density decreases osteopenia. More advanced bone density decrease uh, is osteoporosis. And um, now these terms are defined on, on, um, um, on uh, bone densitometry, and I'll explain that in a moment. One in every two women and one in every eight men will develop an osteoporosis-related related fracture during their lifetime. That's pretty staggering. That's a lot. 40% of women will have vertebral compression fractures by age 80, and the result is can be back pain, but the other result is that you'll get shorter. So this uh, diagram indicates the posture and, and, uh, and the, the, the shape of the spine uh, in the 20s and 60s, and you can see in 60s there's an in, 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 because of the, the thinning of the vertebrae and the com increased compression, um, the back becomes more curved and the posture changes. And it's not uncommon for women who have, who have osteoporosis who are in their 70s. And th th this, by the way, is, is the situation where there's osteoporosis, not normally. Uh, women who are in their 70s actually have a progressively increased curvature of the back. And this little cross-hatching in the lower spine is, indicates the fractures. And then their, their, their belly will protrude because of the way they, they hold their, their spine. So, uh, and you can see the significant loss in, sta in, in, in uh, um, in, in stature and in, in height. So what are the risk factors for osteoporosis? Well, one of them is having a small body frame to begin with. Um, one is having a positive family history, lifelong low calcium intake, early menopause, smoking and alcohol, sedentary lifestyle, Excessive exercise or anorexia nervosa. It's just paradoxical. But women who, um, you know, train for marathons and and, and are, are are will spend you know hours at the gym every day often stop menstruating, and that's uh, and they they and that's because they stop ovulating, and they may have uh, uh, they may develop osteoporosis from the effects on their estrogen levels. And similar with some of the women who have anorexia nervosa, not only have some protein malnutrition, but they also stop ovulating. Women women and men who take steroids over a long period of time or men who have low testosterone can also develop osteoporosis. Some of you who have had bone densitometry will recognize the setup over here. This is a, uh, a bone density test. And the results are what are called DEXA scans. And they're, they're sort of a color, colorized image of the, of the femur or the, uh, the, the uh, big bone in the leg taken at the hip and the um, vertebrae. And the re results are expressed as a, as a T-score, which is the comparison in standard deviations uh, with a 30-year-old female. So a T-score of minus 2 means you're more than two standard deviations below a 30-year-old female. And a Z-score compares you to your, uh, the average for your age and gender. Um, in reality, the T-score is more important than the Z-score because um, the T-score compares you to an ideal, whereas a z-score compares you to people your own age. And the osteoporosis risk, or the fracture risk, is much more correlated with a t-score than with a z-score, because a lot of women in their 50s and 60s have osteopenia and osteoporosis. So being compared to a population that's not normal to begin with um, may tell you how you fare against them, but it doesn't tell you how you fare against an ideal. Usually more than two, de def two uh, more than two standard deviations below the normal T-score will be the definition of, uh, of early osteoporosis. So how do you manage osteoporosis? And prevention begins in childhood with uh, taking the recommended daily allowance of um, calcium of approximately 1,300 milligrams a day, which is about the equivalent of uh, three glasses of milk uh, and 200 international units of vitamin D. And then um, in non-pregnant premenopausal women uh, who are not growing anymore, uh, the requirement goes from 1,300 down to 1,000 milligrams a day. But in women who are pregnant, uh, it goes up again. And in postmenopausal women who are on estrogen replacement therapy, 
um, it's 1,200 milligrams of calcium, and those who are not on replacement therapy, is 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, so it's considerably higher, and 400 units of uh, international units of vitamin D. Smoking cessation is, is associated with increased bone mineral, bone mineral density and increased estrogen turnover. I'm sorry, yeah, and uh, sorry, smoking itself is associated with, with decreased bone mineral density and increased estrogen turnover, and, but it, stopping smoking will, will cause the bone density to rise. Exercise, weight bearing and resistive, that's weight training, have exercise, a little weight lifting uh, or uh, walking um, exercise, which is not strictly cardiovascular, but also uh, weight bearing, um, three or four times a week is associated with increased bone mineral density and muscle tone. Avoiding falls, so take, getting rid of, of things that, are, that will increase the risk of falls, for example, not having a, uh, a bath mat uh, increases the risk of falls, um, small throw rugs can increase the risk of falls. Uh, avoiding certain drugs, such as sedating drugs, which increase the bone turnover, avoiding steroids, or increase, I'm sorry, increasing the risk of falling, such as uh, um, sedation, tranquilizers, things of that nature, can also uh, be an important preventive treatment. Now, if the diet is not sufficient, and most people, most people above the age of 50 are not taking in enough calcium in their diet, uh, calcium is available as a supplement, either in oyster shell calcium or calcium citrate or multivitamins. Um, most multivitamins only contain about two or 300 milligrams of calcium. There are uh, preparations such as uh, um, Spectrovite and Centrum uh, Ultra for, uh, for or silver, I guess to say, for women um, that have uh, extra supplementation that have 500 milligrams of calcium. You can also buy um, things like Adora, which are, are uh, chocolates that contain calcium and, uh, um, and vitamin D, and they're, they not only taste good, but they're a painless way to get the calcium and vitamin D. Um, or you can just take plain oyster shell calcium or calcium citrate. Um, and these are available uh, without prescriptions in any drugstore or any uh, supermarket or nutritional uh, outlet, for, or things like GNC, for example. Um, vitamin D replacement is also recommended, if, especially if there's no sun exposure or in elderly patients or those with kidney disease. Um, you can really get all the vitamin D you need uh, through the diet, uh, and it doesn't require sun exposure, but but there's all, there's some vitamin D is made in the skin in people who are out in the sun or not using a sunscreen. So if there is evidence of, of some impairment of, skin, of, of vitamin D um, synthesis either by low vitamin D level or somebody who's just not getting enough natural vitamin D in their diet or with sun exposure, then vitamin D replace is recommended. And hormone replacement therapy also decreases bone turnover and improves bone mineral density, uh, but the effect wears off when it's discontinued, and it's best if it started early in the menopause. There are drugs called biphosphonates, like Fosamax, which decrease bone resorption. So they allow for bone buildup without bone being uh, resorbed during remodeling. And the effect of low-dose Fosamax given for preventive therapy is comparable to hormone replacement therapy. And it's also given as a once a week dose of 70 milligrams um, for prevention and treatment of osteoporosis. Um, for treatment of osteoporosis, I should say. There are other, there is Boniva, which is given once a month. There is Reclass, which is given once a year. There, there, are, um, there are other ways of giving it if, if it can't be tolerated well by the stomach. And we talked earlier about Avista, the hormone which mimics the effect of estrogen on bones and acts as an anti-estrogen in the breast and uterus. And, um, and this may be helpful as well. It's more effective for the spine than the hip. So what's, what's a girl to do with calcium? Well, any benefit of calcium restriction on PXC is conjectural. And, and it's actually based on one retrospective study which suggested that reduced calcium intake in adolescence may be associated with reduced severity of PXC later in life. But this kind of this was a nutritional study which required people to remember how much yogurt and how much ice cream and how much milk they drank when they were kids and adolescents, and it's very difficult to do. Those kind of studies are not reliable. One case report suggested improvement in the skin of a child uh, on severe calcium restriction, um, but that's not study. That was a one case report, and it's not been replicated. This kid was taking 600 milligrams a day of calcium, which is which is really severe restriction and not healthy. It should be noted that calcium 
levels are not affected by restricting calcium unless they are restricted severely for long periods of time. And what happens then is that rickets develops and um, calcium is removed from the blood to, uh, um, to make up for the loss in the bones. The levels of calcium are tightly regulated by the bone stores and parathyroid hormones, so it doesn't fluctuate much normally because calcium is very is vital for nerve function and muscle function and cardiac function. Calcium restriction over a period of time, however, will lead to osteoporosis. In other words, if you don't, if you don't take in calcium, the only way the body can maintain its blood level of calcium is to sap it up, is to, is to basically uh, sop it up from the bones, and that's why you develop osteoporosis. Now, some of you may have heard about phosphate binders. These are drugs that are, uh, and one of them is actually an antihistamine uh, called antigel. Um, uh, there are aluminum salts that are, and, and other similar compounds that are given to reduce um, uh, bind phosphate. And, and by the, the, the likelihood of, of calcium uh, mineralizing or precipitating out of blood into a, uh, into a, a, a mineral deposit is based on the product of calcium and phosphorus when they're multiplied together. And if you can re reduce the uh, phosphorus, it reduces the chance of that happening. Whereas, for example, in kidney failure, when the phosphorus levels are very high, um, you're much more likely to get what's called uh, uh, ectopic or pathologic calcification. But um, whether um, phosphate binders are effective in improving the skin or the eye and the arterial elastic tissue mineralization and improving the symptoms in course of PXC, um, and whether it can be done safely without adverse effects on bone was a subject of a controlled clinical trial that was done at Mount Sinai uh, about three years ago. And the preliminary results showed no difference in skin calcification and eye findings between the PXC patients taking Renagel, which is a, a product used for acting as a phosphate binder in kidney failure. Um, but both groups had decreased skin calcification. And interestingly, uh, last year, it was when they were looking at the data, because there was some interesting data on magnesium, which we'll talk about shortly, uh, they found that, that both, the med, both the medication, the placebo, had, uh, had, a lot of, uh, so both had a lot of magnesium in them. So it's possible both these may have had enough magnesium to cause some uh, decrease in skin calcification, if that indeed is effective. Uh, and that's why the, the placebo and the drug were, were no different. Um, so it's possible that, that, that they both work, but there's mouse data that suggests that it's probably not the renal gel. Um, given the current state of knowledge, it is recommended that calcium and vitamin D intake be at the recommended daily allowance for one's age, gender, and hormonal status. Um, one nice thing about having the PXE mouse, and again, the PXE mouse is not the PXE human, but the disease is similar enough in both mice and humans that we can draw some conclusions or at least find some clues to what to study, at least in mice. Uh, Increasing calcium ingestion by four times, that would be the equivalent of taking in like six grams a day of calcium, which is a lot of calcium um, in a human, showed no detrimental effect of PX, uh, on PXE. But calcium restriction will increase the risk of osteoporosis and its benefit, in PX, the benefit of calcium restriction in PXE is unproven. So what about magnesium? Well, the recommended daily allowance for magnesium in female adults is 320 to 360 milligrams a day. And the good sources are dark green leafy vegetables like spinach, um, kale, romaine lettuce, um, nuts, and whole grains. Um, and you can get 15% um, of the recommended daily allowance uh, in, um, uh, in a multivitamin tablet. And you can also buy it as a separate supplement. Uh, many adults are deficient in um, 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 in in um, in the magnesium. Now, whether magnesium supplementation is effective in uh, preventing or reversing mineralization of PXC uh, in children and adults, and whether this changes clinical outcomes in the skin and the eye and cardiovascular system, and how much supplementation is needed, and how safe this is for bone health, are all unknown. Uh, one thing I can tell you is that uh, taking too much magnesium uh, will <clears throat> produce diarrhea. One of the uh, some of you may be familiar with mag citrate or magnesium citrate, which is a commonly used prep for barium enemas and colonoscopies. Uh, it's a good way of cleaning yourself out. So you, you should do this under some sort of medical supervision, or certainly not not exceed the recommended daily allowance of uh, 300 to 400 milligrams a day. Um, so we don't know, for example, whether the, whether this will prevent or reverse mineralization in humans. 
and whether this is going to change the clinical outcome, how the skin looks, or whether the eye deteriorates or not, or whether there bleeds and so forth. Um, so there's a lot that needs to be determined about, about magnesium. One of the things that has been found about magnesium is that in mice, um, supplementing the, the magnesium uh, in a diet by five times uh, the recommended daily allowance for the mouse uh, prevents mineralization of the tissues completely if it started at birth and will, will arrest it if it started at age three months in mice. So right now there's a controlled clinical trial of magnesium supplementation in PXC going on at Mount Sinai and hopefully in a year or two uh, there'll be um, some results to report but it may take a lot longer to see if it has any effect on the outcome of PXC. We're going to wind up now with the a short talk about mammography and PXC. Um, we did a study uh, with the co cooperation of many of you in, in PXC International who sent mammograms. Um, and the reason we did the study is because several uh, women had reported to us that they had had mammograms which showed calcifications, and which in retrospect they thought might have been due to PXC, and they had to undergo breast biopsy, but nothing was found. So we reviewed 51 mammograms in 109 control patients who were age matched. And what we found in breast, in bre what was known to be in the uh, diagnostic finding in breast cancer were clusters of microcalcifications. The study showed that in PXC there was an increased incidence of microcalcifications, these are very small calcifications, in the breast tissue and vascular calcification. Uh, all, both of which are findings seen in the normal population. So it's not uncommon to see some degree of vascular calcification in uh, normal uh, adults. Uh, it can be due to diabetes. It can be due to just uh, normal aging. Uh, it doesn't have to be due to PXC. And um, it, it's, it's, it's such a common finding uh, in the normal, normal population um, that it's not a very specific finding of PXC because if you see it, uh, it's much more likely not to be due to PXC. And there was an increased incidence of skin thickening, so that when you when you uh, uh, looked at the skin of, uh, of the axilla uh, or the underarm in the in the uh, in the axillary folds uh, in the mammogram in PXC, the skin looked abnormally thick. That's because of the laxity of the skin. It's not that the skin itself is actually thicker, but when we talk about skin thickness on an X-ray, it really refers to the way the skin folds lie, as opposed to the actual microscopic thickness you'd see on a biopsy. You can see here where the, at the end of the arrow there is pointing to the, uh, to the uh, calcifications of the axillary skin. That's the uh, skin of the underarm, which shows up at the edge of the, of the uh, mammogram. So we found that there was no increase in breast cancer in PXE. Um, the only specific finding is thickened axillary skin with microcalcification. Everything else was uh, maybe increased in PXE, but was not specific enough to be diagnostic. So if you found skin thick, any, any three of the following, skin thickening, skin calcification, breast microcalcifications, and vascular calcification, this would suggest the possibility of PXC. So if you saw calcifications in the skin and in the breast itself and in the vessels, uh, that would be highly suggestive of PXC. If you found skin thickening and skin calcification, which is very specific of PXC, and maybe vascular calcification, that would be very suggestive. But the pattern of microcalcification of the breast in PXC is benign and does not suggest cancer and that just being aware in PXE of this possibility may uh, lead to heightened awareness by the radiologist um, as to what's abnormal and what's normal and, and reduce the, the likelihood of there being an unnecessary breast biopsy. But the bottom line is women who have had breast cancer are not immune to PXE and uh, just because they're microcalcifications they should not be blown off. So a message from our sponsors. Um, the upcoming webinar is on May 10th. How to use social media. I guess that includes Twitter and Facebook and uh, um, so forth. And on June 2nd, what is the NIH anyway, and why should I care? And hopefully, why should Congress care? And uh, the addresses for registering for the webinar are posted here as well. You can see many of the past webinars, uh, which are archived on pxc.org slash past hyphen webinars. So I will open the... Uh, floor, so to speak, uh, for questions. Thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive overview. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Um, the first one is, what about um, women who, uh, should, should they uh, uh, have a C-section to deliver their child if they have uh, angioid streaks or retinal involvement? Okay. 
the question, well, actually, I don't need to repeat the question because they, they, they all hear you. Usually the problem I have with talks is that there's somebody sitting in the front row and muttering the question <laughs> so nobody else can hear it. But uh, Well, the, that's, that's a good question. Um, there is no evidence that um, that the vaginal delivery will cause a problem um, in women who just have um, uh, angioite streaks or have um, um, just you know or have who've not had any retinal bleeding or, or leakage. I, th I certainly think women who've had active uh, who have neovascularization or have had active leakage during the uh, pregnancy or or the past or who have a um, 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 history of having needed treatment for it. Uh, probably should and under should should have a delivery by um, um, cesarean section because bearing down certainly increases the pressure within the vessels in the eye and probably could predispose to to uh, bleeding. Uh, but it's very uncommon for that situation to occur. Just the presence of angioid streaks alone is not going to uh, bearing down is not going to cause uh, neovascularization to occur. It's not going to there was angioid streaks don't bleed. It's it's the fragile vessels that do so. Uh, unless there's actually actually active bleeding or, or leakage during pregnancy, there should be no reason. And if there's any doubt before delivery, uh, uh, a pregnant woman should have have a retinal examination just to make sure everything is safe to go with a vaginal delivery. Thank you. Um, when you were talking about calcium, uh, you mentioned a mouse that was given um, excessive amounts of calcium up to four or five times. Mm -hmm. Have there been any, any uh, and there were no adverse effects, have there mm -hmm. been any case studies on people uh, who took in a lot of calcium or drank a lot um, of No, there have not been. Um, I know of, of patients who, have, who drink excessive amounts of milk, um, and um, but the problem there is that the excessive amounts of milk come with excessive amounts of, 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 uh, of uh, saturated fat, and, uh, and, and the most flagrant example I'm aware of, that, that was an issue of, of producing the early coronary artery disease and, and weight gain, but but in terms of uh, 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 we have no evidence that either anecdotal or otherwise that calcium uh, supplement excessive calcium supplementation has caused a problem, but there really isn't any need to take excessive amounts of calcium. I mean, you can't, you know, when you get you get beyond a certain amount, um, then you run the risk of getting kidney stones and you know excreting too much calcium. You can't. In other words, you, you, it doesn't all get sopped into the bone if you keep taking it. It's got to be the bone has to be able to to, to metabolize it and to uh, and to include it into bone into bone into bone mineral into hydroxyapatite or bone mineral. So um, so I mean, there are people who've probably done it inadvertently by by drinking too much milk or or or, uh, or getting having hypervitaminosis D where they've you know, been develop vitamin D toxicity, but uh, I'm not aware of, of any issues in PXC. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's a hard thing to study because to do that kind of study in a human is very difficult. You'd, you'd never get it past the, uh, an ethics committee IRB. The, the, there would be no, there's no valid reason to give somebody that amount of calcium. There's no health benefit to taking that amount, uh, number one. And number two, if, if there's any possible risk, um, it, would, it wouldn't be fair to subject uh, volunteers to that risk. So. Um, so uh, the only way we could, we could do that study would be to retrospectively look at people who've taken, who've had that kind of calcium intake, and compare them to people who haven't, and that's not been done. Mm -hmm. Something we probably could do, could have done from our epidemiologic studies if we had it, if we had accurate enough information as to how much calcium people took in. We could probably still do it. We have the data, but I, I, we found the nutritional studies to be really unreliable and not that helpful. And I did. Yeah, I didn't, you always have to remember the data. You're reporting what you remember you ate or took. Um, Probably, yeah, I mean, it just depends too much on people's memory. It's not, it's not, it's not well controlled. Right. Thank you. Um, and what about kidney stones? Are they related to PXC at all? You no, mentioned that. No, they're not. No, kidney stones are. Uh, there, there, there are various kinds of kidney stones. They can be, the most common are uh, uh, stones containing um, uh, calcium and phosphorus, or uh, uh, and they're the results of, of either too much. Uh, Calcium being excreted in the urine, or um, certain some people have a tendency to have a, a urine pH that favors uh, stone formation, um, or they can be uric acid stones from having too much uric acid in the blood. But they have nothing to do with 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 uh, uh, mineralization of elastic tissues, which you see in PXC. This is these are actually uh, uh, calcium precipitating out of the urine and forming a stone, as opposed to uh, calcium. Uh, 
uh, binding to elastic tissue. You, if you do, for example, if you do a um, uh, an ultrasound of the kidney, you, it looks like a snowstorm of microcalcification. Uh, that's just calcium in, in the in the elastic tissue of the blood vessels. It's not. Uh, um, it's nothing. It's not. It does nothing to do with kidney stones. And does calcification calcification in the kidney? Uh, do we see that as being related to PAC? I mean, microcalcifications, like in uh, breast. I'm sorry. We'll, we'll repeat that question again. Um, microcalcifications in in the kidney are they seen in PXCs at, in the same way you see microcalcifications due to PXC in the in mammograms? Um, yeah, I think the mechanism is similar, but but um, it's a little different. For example, when we've done testicular um, uh, ultrasounds in men who have PXC, um, we find microcalcifications in, in almost all of them. Uh, so it seems to be a, a physiologic thing that that all men with with PXC are getting. They're getting calcium deposits in some of the elastic tissues of the uh, uh, either the vessels or or the, in the in the um, uh, tissue of the testis um, and um, for some reason, uh, the same sort of thing is occurring normally in the kidneys. So it's not something that would show up on an ordinary x-ray, but on an ultrasound, which is a very sensitive way of picking up uh, echoes from uh, microcalcifications, uh, it, it seems to be a common incidental finding. It's not um, something that, that you, uh, uh, you we don't usually go looking for it. Sometimes people who have uh, PXC will undergo a um, 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 an ultrasound for some other reason. They have an abdominal ultrasound looking for something completely unrelated. and uh, in the process of doing so, uh, it's, it's an incidental finding gets reported, and some, you know people don't know what it is. But we, it's, we've seen it often enough to know that it, it, it's just a normal finding in PXC. It doesn't indicate anything pathological going on. Thank you. And we have one last question, sure. and that is: um, hair loss in women is there any relationship to PXC? No, no, not at all. The hair loss in in, uh, um, in women has many causes. Um, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm not sure exactly what the questioner meant, but um, the most common type of hair loss we see is so-called androgenic, androgenic alopecia, where the hair becomes thinner uh, on the scalp and usually in the center in front of the scalp. So it looks when you look at the hair, you can see the, the skin more readily. Uh, it's not baldness as we see in men; it's just a kind of a thinning of hair. And um, that type of um, um, uh, hair loss is. Um, uh, Probably hormonally related, or genetically related, or some combination there, there thereof, and um, it's nothing to do with PXC. And um, then there are other forms of hair loss we see, for example, after pregnancy or going on or off the pill, where women shed hair. But those are hormonal changes. You sometimes see the women who are uh, starving themselves on a crash diet or, or lose a lot of weight. But these are, but PXC is not associated with. It has no effect on the hair follicle. The only, the only hairs we know that are affected by PXC are, are the vibrissae, the uh, little whiskers on mice. Uh, that's the first place they get calcification, but it doesn't make the hairs fall out or do anything like that. Well, thank you very much um, okay. for that, uh, answering all the questions and for your very comprehensive overview of the health issues of uh, women with PXE. Um, I'd like to again point out on the, the final slide here, if you have any other questions that come up, you can email them to info at pxc.org or call the office at the, at the number listed. Uh, we have again to upcoming webinars, uh, May 10th, how to use social media, and you will be instructed by our young new executive director. I'm going to watch and, that. Yes. Yeah. Learn how to Facebook. <laughs> anyone, anyone over 50, I think, needs to see that. And um, June 2nd, what is the NIH anyway, and why should I care, um, given by a, uh, one of our board members, Claire Driscoll. And I'd like to thank you all for attending tonight. And uh, Dr. Berkovich, once again, thank you very much for spending okay, your time pleasure. with us. Okay, this concludes our webinar.